It's not how much money you make that will determine whether you become wealthy or not. It's what you do with the money you make. Like if you make $100,000 and then you go out and you spend all $100,000, you're broke. But if you make $10,000 and you spend $1,000 but you invest $9,000, now you're on a path to become wealthy. And that's why in this video, I'm going to be going over 7 things that you need to do with your money. That way you can build wealth. First things first, in case you're wondering. I was replacing the light bulb in my bathroom and somehow as I was unscrewing the light bulb, the light bulb shattered and it slipped my finger which is why I have a bandaid on. But everything's okay. We're back on YouTube. No delays there. I talked about the things that you need to do with your money as soon as you get paid. That way you have a proper financial system. If you haven't seen that video i'll link that video for you in the description below but in this video i want to talk about the seven things that you need to be using your money to buy that way you can actually build wealth this goes way beyond just having a budget and knowing how to spend your money this is what you need to be buying and using your money for that way you have the financial planning tools that you need that way you can actually become wealthy money can't buy you happiness but money can buy you a nice car and money can buy you a nice home for your family. And money can buy your spouse a nice vacation. And money can buy you some extra guac. But before you can get the freedom that money can buy you, you need to know where your money needs to go before you put your money towards all of your wants. And we all know that guacamole is definitely a need. That's why in this video, I'm going to be going over the seven places that your money needs to go, not including guacamole. That way you can build your wealth. But before we get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below without cutting your finger. The first place your money needs to go is obviously Obviously, your basic needs. This is your car, your house, your food, your water, your basic necessities that you need in order to survive. The thing that you really got to do here is you got to really draw a line to understand where your real needs are and where your wants start. My cousin's friend just graduated college and he got this new position in Phoenix. So he flew out to Phoenix, got this new job. The only problem was he needed a car to get to him from work and he didn't have a lot of money to buy a new car. So he talks to my cousin about what he should do and they talked about getting a used car that way he didn't have to blow all of his money to get a new car or blow his future money on a new car. Anyways, so he's looking at used cars and he ends up going to the BMW dealership calls up my cousin and he says guess what i'm buying a new four series so now this guy let's call him bunty 2.0 needed a car but instead of buying a car with cash that he could afford that we didn't have to worry about payments he ended up going to the bmw dealership and he bought himself a four series where now he's going to be paying five to six hundred dollars a month for at least the next three years to lease out this car so let's take a look at this you need a car and i think he put down four thousand dollars when he leased the bmw and so you have a couple options. You can go out, put down $4,000 and lease a car. And now you're going to be paying right around five to $600 a month. Let's just say $500 a month. And this is now a payment scheme that you're starting. Once you lease a car at the end of the lease, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to want to lease another car or buy another car because at the end of the lease, all these car companies are going to tack on a whole bunch of fines and fees if you don't take another car from this company. So it's very unattractive to go out and buy a different car somewhere else or buy something that you can afford with cash. So when people start this payment scheme, they stay on this payment scheme forever. So now let's assume that now you're going to be paying this $500 a month every month for the next 30 years. After 30 years, what's going to happen? You're going to be left with nothing. Even if you own your car after 30 years, you're going to own a car that's really worth nothing because your cars aren't worth anything. But if you took this $4,000 and you bought yourself a used car with cash, a good working condition car, now you have this $4,000 car, you have no monthly payments. What you can do is instead take this $500 a month and invest it. And if you took this $500 a month and you invested it and you could get a reasonable 7% and no return on your money. So you're just throwing your money in the stock market and you're hoping to get a little bit below average return. So we're not even talking about beating the market or even trying to meet the market. We're talking about a little bit below average. You just get a 7% return and you do this for the next 30 years. You're going to have something like $600,000 in your account on the side just because you used this money to pay yourself instead of using this money to pay your car company. And so this is where you got to decide what's your need versus what's your want. You need a car. You just want a BMW. Now, don't get me wrong here. I want you to drive a nice car. I love nice cars. I really like BMWs. But you got to decide what your goal is right now. Are you trying to flex on Instagram or are you trying to become wealthy? Because these two things are going to give you two financially different results. If you're just trying to flex on Instagram, then sure, blow your money on a car. But if your goal is to become wealthy, then screw the car right now. Go invest this money into yourself and buy something beat up that is working. That way you have this money every single month that you can invest into yourself. That way you can build your wealth. 
Once you are ready, then go out and buy yourself whatever car you want because you can afford it without worrying about the price because now you're building that wealth or you've already built that wealth. This is where you gotta really dig deep and figure out what do you really need and what do you just want because every dollar that you're spending on things that you don't need is a dollar that you cannot invest back in yourself. Now, you gotta understand here also, the goal is not to live small for the rest of your life. I don't want you to be the super frugal person who's just pinching pennies because at the end of the day, a penny saved is just a penny. I just want you to understand that right now, the easiest way to have some extra cash is just by not spending all of your cash. And so if you can understand how to live below your means, that way you have some extra cash, now you can put this money to work to help build you wealth. Now, again, I don't want you to just to live small. I want you to work to grow the pie because there's a limit to how many pennies you can pinch and how small you can live, but there's no limit to how much money you can earn. But the first step to being able to build this wealth is you gotta stop blowing all your money on things that you don't need. That way you have money to buy things that will actually build you wealth. The second place your money needs to go is towards your savings, but you gotta make sure you're doing this the right way. Growing up, I was always told that if I wanted to become wealthy, the way you do that is by making a big salary and then you save as much money as possible. Turns out that's a big lie. You will never become wealthy by just saving your money. When you save your money, your money is just sitting flat. It's not growing. Well, at the same time, the value of your savings and your dollars are losing value and being diluted because of inflation. That's why when we talk about saving money, you want to make sure you're saving your money the right way and the smart way, not the majority mindset way. For the majority of people, saving money is the path to freedom because when you save your money, now you have this big bank account, hopefully, that you can now use to go and buy things with. The only problem with that is if you could go out and save $100,000, you might feel rich, but $100,000 today is not gonna buy you what $100,000 could 50 years ago, and $100,000 in 50 years will not be able to buy you what $100,000 can today. 50 years ago, if you had $100,000, you would be able to buy what $600,000 can buy you today. And in 50 years from now, $100,000, depending on what inflation is, might only be able to buy you half or a quarter of what $100,000 can buy you today. When I save my money, I'm only saving money for three things. I'm saving money for emergencies, I'm saving money for a big purchase, or I'm saving money for an investment. You gotta have a savings account with some cash in there because when an emergency happens, because that's life. You want to make sure you have cash to fall back on. That way when your car breaks down or your AC breaks, you don't got to go into debt to fix the problem. A good savings fund should have something like 3 to 12 months worth of expenses. So depending on what your risk tolerance is, that's where you kind of want to have the savings fund be. Second, you want to save for big purchases. If you want to buy a brand new car or you want to buy yourself a new home and you need a down payment or you want to buy a big TV, these things cost money and you got to save money in order to do that. You have to treat these two savings accounts differently because the last thing you want to do is use your emergency money to go out and buy a TV. Do not mix these accounts together because these need to be separate. And third, you should save your money for investments. I have a separate account where I have cash that I'm waiting to invest. I'm always looking for investment deals, whether it's on the stock market or whether it's real estate. I want to find a good opportunity. This is the cash that I use to go and buy it. I'm not using my emergency money. I want to use my investment money for that, which is why you want to keep this separate. And this brings me to number three. The third place you need to invest your money is in your investments. Your investments are things that are gonna pay you for owning them because now when you have some extra cash, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can go out and go shopping, buy yourself a brand new wardrobe, which isn't gonna make you any money, or you can take this extra cash and you can invest it into a company or invest it into a property that is going to pay you for owning it. At the very bare minimum, you have to own some stocks or real estate. If you wanna invest other places like crypto and Forex and commodities, gold and silver, fine, but make sure you at least own some stocks and real estate. The whole idea behind investing your money in stocks is instead of you taking your money and going out shopping in the mall and spending all your money in stores, you're taking your money and you're buying a piece of the store company. That way as stores make more money, so do you. It's essentially a way for you to stop being just a consumer and spending all your money to make everybody else rich and for you to start being a producer. That way now when companies make money, you're one of the people that's benefiting because if the company makes more money, so do you. With real estate, it's a little bit different. With real estate, you own something physical and tangible because when you invest your money in the stock, you just get a paper certificate saying that you own shares of a company, but if the company goes bust, then you own nothing. Real estate, on the other hand, when you buy a property, you own land, you own a building, you own bricks, you own windows. So you own something that you can see, feel, and touch, and it creates income because if you buy a property, you can have a family live in there and they'll pay you rent every single month for living in your property. So now you own something real that you can see and feel and you're creating income. And the whole hope is if you're buying a property in a good area, the property value is gonna go up and so will your rents. So you're creating income and you own something physical and tangible. Stocks and real estate are both good investments. I have my money in both. I prefer real estate 
just because I like the income that I can create and I like the idea of owning something real, but I also have money in the stock market. And so you gotta really just figure out what your goals are and what helps you do that. The fourth place your money needs to go is asset protection because as soon as people realize you have money, they're gonna try to take their hands and put it in your pocket and take some of your money and keep it for themselves. You don't wanna let that happen, which is why you wanna put up a shield asset protection to protect yourself and your family. Now, while I am an attorney, I'm not your attorney. So if you have specific legal questions, make sure you talk to a professional in your area. First thing you gotta do is you gotta have some estate planning. The whole idea behind this is if you're building wealth, you're gonna have money. And when you die, you gotta know where this money is gonna go because if you do not tell this money where to go, then your family is gonna be fighting for who gets the money. If you wanna avoid those fights, plan ahead, do some estate planning. There's a couple things you can do. You can get a will, you can get a trust. It's gonna depend on what your financial situation is as to what is better for you. But the whole idea behind a will and a trust is you get to tell your money after you die where your money is gonna go. If you don't do this type of estate planning when you're alive, then the government's gonna come in and they're gonna decide where your money should go. You never want the government to decide where your money should go. So do this type of estate planning that way your family is not fighting for your money in the future. You also gotta protect your assets by having insurance. Nobody likes paying for insurance, but insurance is a small price you pay today to protect you against a big headache in the future. This is gonna be things like car insurance, health insurance, home insurance, life insurance. I know it's not fun to pay for all of these things, but if something bad were to happen to your car, your home, your health, your life, then your insurance company would come in and they would pay you or your family a big check that your family is at least financially okay. Things like car insurance, health insurance, home insurance are pretty obvious because if your car burns down or if your house lights on fire, then the insurance company is gonna come in and they're gonna give you a check to go out and buy a new home or a new car. But life insurance isn't always straightforward. The whole idea behind life insurance is if you die within your life insurance period, then your life insurance company will give your family a big check. That way, at least your family will be able to survive financially even if you're not there because the last thing you want is for you to be the breadwinner for your family and then you're no longer there and your family cannot survive anymore without you. So they have to put up a GoFundMe page to raise money to pay for your funeral costs and to pay for your basic living costs. The good news about life insurance is it doesn't have to cost you a whole lot of money. Like if you're a healthy 30 year old guy, you can get a million dollar life insurance policy for less than a dollar a day. The fifth place your money needs to go is in your education even if you think you're done with school. Growing up I always thought that education meant school. Nowadays for me education means everything outside of the classroom. One of the easiest ways to fast track your financial success is just to keep learning because the more you know the more you can do. My education comes from five different places. Books, classes, experts, experience, and mistakes. I'm not a big fan of actually reading books, but I go on a five mile walk or I try to go on a five mile walk every morning and this takes me about an hour and a half and during my walk, I like to listen to audiobooks. I buy quite a few online classes. Some of them help me personally and some of them help our business grow. You can learn from experts on YouTube or podcasts or you can hire consultants. When it comes to learning from experience, one of the core values at Minority Mindset is fast is better than slow. And the whole idea behind that is instead of spending all of your time just thinking about what to do, go out and implement it and learn from whatever you're doing. And even if you make a mistake, which is the fifth way I learn, you can learn way more from your mistakes than you do your successes. I made a video on YouTube where I talked about my worst real estate deal ever. That was the only property I ever lost money on, but that money that I lost was really just like tuition into real estate investing because I learned so much about investing in real estate from that one deal. Learn as much as you can by reading books, watching YouTube videos, and taking classes. That's good but it's never gonna replace experiential learning. You have to go out and you gotta just put yourself out there because you're always gonna run over hurdles that other people have not, and you gotta figure out how to overcome them. The sixth place your money's got to go is your health, and this isn't what most people think about when they think of health. If you've ever heard me talk about my quadrifid triangle, I believe that there are four fitnesses in life, four places that you need to be fit if you wanna live a happy and successful life. The bottom is physical fitness, then mental fitness, then spiritual fitness, and at the very top, it is financial fitness. If you wanna invest in your health, you need to be investing in your physical health, your mental health, and your spiritual health. Everything else is about your financial health. Starting at the bottom with your physical health, invest in good food and a gym membership or some workout equipment. Look, I'm not a doctor, sorry mom and dad, but the best medicine is being proactive and taking care of your health. I know you're working hard to get that bonus and feed your family and go on that vacation, but you gotta take care of your body too because this is the only one you got. Second is your mental health. If you are not happy, it does not matter how much money you have. It does not matter how successful you are, you will never be able to appreciate the things you accomplished. And so if you have this anxiety, your depression, and you are not happy, get it taken care of. Go into therapy, get some counseling, go into rehab. Whatever the cost is, 
pay it because if you are not happy and you're not able to live with yourself then it does not matter how successful you are because your mind is going to be holding you back so take care of your mental health because that is going to be a pillar for the success of your whole life and the third part of this is your spiritual health and when i say spiritual health i don't just mean religion i mean it could mean that but it's really what is your purpose do you really feel like you're on this earth to help underserved people if it is go out and give some of your money to charity or go give some of your money to your purpose figure out what it is that's driving passion that wakes you up every single morning and put some money into that because if you do not feel fulfilled if you do not feel like you have a purpose then you're going to have no reason to get out of bed every single day and the seventh place your money needs to go is to your family now when i say your family i don't mean that when your cousin bunty goes and blows his money at gucci that he goes and asks you for another two thousand dollars and you just give him this money i mean taking care of your family you know when you're on your journey to build wealth you're going to do whatever you can to invest every single penny you can because you understand that this money invested is going to be able to make you a whole lot more money in the future. And as you do that, you're going to have to make sacrifices as a family. Maybe you don't get the nice car. Maybe you don't get that new home. Maybe you don't go on that vacation right now. But as you really start to build this financial foundation and this financial wealth, reward your family. Take your family and your kids on a nice vacation. Buy your spouse something nice because of what they put up with. I know it is hard building wealth. You got to make sacrifices. But as you start to see the success, don't just live frugal in the sense that you never enjoy your money for the rest of your life. Money only has value if you spend it and support the people that supported you. So as you start to build your wealth, make sure you take care of your family too. People are spending $400 on an umbrella when they have no job. They're going into debt, credit card debt, to buy lottery tickets because some states let you buy lottery tickets on a credit card. And then they're praying to get approved for a store credit card so they can save 15% off of their order. And now you're wondering why you're broke. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That means if you walk out of your house right now and you look down the street and you look at your neighbors, Eight out of 10 of your neighbors don't have a couple thousand dollars in their bank account right now to protect them from a financial emergency. It doesn't matter where you live. This is the reality of what's going on in America right now. The majority of people are broke. I know this is going to hurt a lot of people's feelings, but there's a lot more to this than just how much money you make. I've talked about people like Earl Crawley on our YouTube channel who make minimum wage and yet have built a multiple six-figure investment and savings account while having kids, while living a life. And then on the other hand, I've also talked about people like Henry's. If you remember, Henry is an acronym that stands for High Income Earner Not Rich Yet. And it's this movement of people that make at least six figures a year that are broke because their goal right now is not to save money or invest money but to live this lavish lifestyle where they're spending all their money to look rich this is where the vast majority of people get kind of offended and they put up the smoke screen and they say things like oh you shouldn't talk about money like that and you shouldn't worry about money when in reality we all use money every single day if money really didn't matter then why are you going to work every single day to get a paycheck? Now, I get it. There's a lot more to life than money, okay? Money is just one small aspect of our life. But if you don't understand money, and if you don't have money, you become a slave to money because now you're drowning in debt and you have all these payments that you can't afford. So you're going to work every single day not to enjoy your life, not to do something fulfilling, but just so you can make your back payments. But if you understand money and you know how to use money and you can grow your money, now you can build your wealth. Now you can take care of yourself and your family financially and you have more money to help other people and to help your community because you have the resources to do that. If you're broke, you don't have the resources to help other people. When you're broke and you're drowning in debt, the only person that you're helping is your bank because you're paying these insane rates on money that you borrow to buy things that you didn't even need. So many Americans put a lot of weight on luck when it comes to success and I'm speaking strictly financial success right now. They see somebody who's become wealthy or rich and they say, oh, this person must have become wealthy. They must have inherited the wealth or they must have just got lucky with their business or their investments or whatever. Luck is the reason why they're successful. If that was the case, why is it that 88% of millionaires are self-made? That means these are people who did not have millionaire parents. These are people who created their millions themselves. Nine out of 10 millionaires out there that are millionaires made it themselves. This is where you can say, oh, they had an advantage or they had this or they had that. We can spend the rest of our lives looking for advantages that other people had as to why they could become successful or you can spend that same time understanding how to use your money the right way. That way you can build your wealth because there's a system to understanding how to use your money. The first thing you got to do is get your mindset right. I talked about this a little while ago on YouTube, but I was at Speedway getting gas and Speedway actually had this video on their screen. I was talking about how they let you buy lottery tickets with credit cards. 
And I went in because I needed to get a pack of gum. And there was a lady there who was frantic, who was freaking out because her credit card got rejected when she was trying to buy like $150 worth of lottery tickets. She was buying dozens and dozens of lottery tickets because this was her kind of hope of becoming successful. Spending all your money on lottery tickets or financing this lottery tickets is gambling and it's a straight path to broke. Not only are you not going to win, but now you're going to be spending all your future paychecks paying off these bad decisions. Wealth is a long term game. And if you really want to know the secrets to not being broke and the secrets to becoming wealthy, there's five things that you need to understand. These are the five things you have to understand. First, you got to stop living in a net zero life. Second, you got to avoid the money traps that are out there. Third, you need to know how to grow your money and grow your wealth faster. Fourth, you got to stop living in this game of the fake flex. And five, you need to understand the game of how money works. These are the five things I'm going to be going over in this video. So make sure you watch this video until the end. First, let's talk about living this net zero lifestyle because this net zero lifestyle is keeping the majority of people broke and it is holding you back from becoming wealthy. The way it works is like this. The majority of people think, okay, I have $100 in my bank account right now. And if I have $100 in my bank account, that means I can go out and I can spend $100 on a pair of shoes because I have $100 in my bank account. If I have $100, I should be able to spend $100. This is net zero thinking because if you have $100, you can spend $100. This mindset kills people's wealth because if you have $100, you cannot afford to spend $100. This is why I keep saying that your income is not what determines if you're going to become wealthy or not. And your income is not what's going to determine if you're going to live broke or not. It's what you do with your money. If you make $100,000 and then you spend $100,000, guess what? You're broke. If you make $20,000 a year and you spend $20,000, guess what? You're still broke. The very first thing you have to understand is you are not allowed to spend every dollar that you have because some of your money needs to be saved to protect you from emergencies and some of your money needs to be invested to help build your wealth, okay? If you have $100 in your bank account, you cannot afford to spend $100. This becomes even more true if this money that's in your bank account is not yours. So when I was in law school, I had this friend or acquaintance rather that was in my law school with me and I was talking to him one day about what his plans were for the evening and then he told me that he was going out to buy a really nice umbrella. I thought it was kind of funny that his like evening activity was to buy an umbrella but I understand it because you know we're in a rainy area and it's not fun to go walk around when it's wet outside so I told him that I bought my umbrella from Home Depot and I paid like five dollars from it and he told me, now remember, this is when we were in law school, okay? He did not have a job. He told me that he wanted to go out and buy this really fancy $400 umbrella. He showed it to me on his phone. And I was like, $400 for an umbrella? Who spends $400 on an umbrella? And he told me that he had this extra cash from his student loans in his bank account. So he wanted to use this money to buy and invest in this umbrella. So when he goes to these attorney interviews, he's going to look really fancy with his $400 umbrella in his hand. That is net zero thinking on steroids. Now you assume, oh, I have $400 in my bank account, even though this money is not yours. This is money from the bank. And you feel like you need to spend this money because this cash is in your bank bank. When you live this lifestyle of spending every dollar you have in your bank, whether it's your money or someone else's money, it's even more expensive when it's someone else's money. But when you have this need to spend every dollar you have on things that don't make you money, like an umbrella, you are going to be broke. The solution to this net zero thinking is to create a system where you are not allowed to spend all the money you have. You have to create the system where you know that you have to live below your means. This is where our rule of five comes into play. Our rule of five says, if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. So if you have $100 in your bank account, and we're talking about things you don't need to survive, if you have $100 in your bank account and you wanna go buy something, you can only afford to buy something that costs $20. Because if you have $100 in your bank account, this $20 thing is what you can afford to buy five times over. So if you cannot buy it five times, you can't afford to buy it one time. Second, let's talk about money traps to avoid because the majority of Americans are broke and will never build wealth because they're spending money they don't have on things they don't need, which will never make them any money. Sometimes this is obvious. Like I just gave you that example of that person I knew in law school who had money from student loans. This money was not his. This is the bank's money that he spent to buy an umbrella. 
right? But sometimes this money trap isn't so obvious. When the majority of people say that they can afford something, what they actually mean is I can make the monthly payments, but that's very different than being able to afford something. The simplest example of this is your cell phone, okay? Your thousand dollar cell phone that you have in your pocket. So many people are financing this phone on 20, 30, 40, 50 dollar monthly payments because they cannot afford to pay a thousand dollars for a phone. So they think, oh, I can afford this phone because I can pay $50 a month with 0% APR financing. So I'm not paying any extra money in interest and I can afford this phone, right? But this is a money trap. What happens when you finance something that you can't afford, that you don't have the cash to buy upfront? Well, now you're going to be paying this 20, 30, 40, $50 a month for the rest of your life because every year you're going to get into this trap of buying a brand new phone. And then secondly, you never have the pain of this money leaving your wallet. You think that you just bought a thousand dollar phone, but you never had the pain of a thousand dollars leaving your wallet. All you saw was $50 leaving your account every single month. And so you think now, oh, I bought this thousand dollar phone and it's only costing me $50 a month. So let me go and buy this $2,000 laptop that you can't afford, but it's only $85 a month. So now you buy that. And then you buy the sofa that you can't afford because that's only $75 a month. And now you're spending money on things that you can't afford because you think you can live way up here but you can actually afford down here. You thought you were being financially smart by paying 0% APR, but you just got played because now you're spending more money on things that you don't need because you never had the pain of money leaving your pocket in the first place. The reason 0% APR is so profitable for businesses is because when you buy things with 0% APR, you never have the pain of money leaving your bank. And so now you can buy a whole bunch of things that you didn't know that you can afford because you can't actually afford it. All you think you can afford is the monthly payments. There's a difference between being able to afford a smartphone and being able to make the monthly payments. There's a difference between being able to afford a brand new car and being able to make the payments. You need to start being able to afford the things you buy, not just making the monthly payments. The goal with the first two things that I talked about, not living net zero and avoiding money traps is all so you can grow your money and your wealth faster. If you follow the first two things that I just talked about, you avoid net zero, you avoid these money traps, what you're going to see happen is all of a sudden you're going to find extra money in your bank account out of nowhere. Now, what you want to do with this extra money is you want to put some of it to work. That way you can grow your wealth faster. There's two terms you need to understand assets and liabilities. I've talked about this before. So if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, make sure you do that. But what you need to understand are assets are things that put money in your pocket. Liabilities are things that take money away from your pocket. Your $400 umbrella, your shoes, your lottery tickets, all these things are liabilities. If you're spending money on something and it's not putting money in your pocket, or if you're not buying it for the sole purpose of making money, it's a liability. The interesting thing about liabilities though is liability make you look rich, right? When you go out and you buy a fancy new wardrobe, you buy new shoes, you buy a new purse, you buy a new cell phone, you buy a new watch, all this stuff makes you look rich. And so this is what broke people do. Broke people spend all their money on liabilities. That way they can look rich, but they're actually just product rich. You look rich, but you're actually broke because you have no assets. If you want to become wealthy, you got to flip this around. You need to start spending more money on assets, which are things that pay you for owning them. And then once you have more money coming in, then you can afford to buy these liabilities. The first time I really understood this concept of assets and liabilities was when I first started investing in real estate. I was running this event planning business and I had money in my bank account and I really wanted to buy this BMW. It was the three series and I really wanted to buy a three series because it looks sweet and it would look really cool with my image. But then for some reason, I was reading books and every book talked about how wealthy people own real estate. I had no idea what real estate investing was. I didn't grow up with real estate investing family members, but I decided, you know, I wanted to try this out. So instead of using my money to buy a car, I ended up buying a small little condo. This condo, as soon as I bought it, about a month later after renovating it, I rented it out for $600 a month. And after paying all expenses, I was left with $250 a month in profit every single month. And I didn't have to physically do any work to get this $250 a month. This was passive income I was getting because I spent my money buying an asset instead of using my money to buy a liability, which was a car. Assets are things that put more money in your pocket. These are the things you need to buy if you want to build wealth. Liabilities are things that make you look rich, 
but they keep you broke. So now if your goal is to become wealthier faster, you got to spend less money here and buy more assets aggressively. And it doesn't have to be a ton of money to start. You can start with $5 a day or $5 a week or $20 a week, whatever you have. You just got to make these small incremental investments. That way you can buy these assets and build your wealth faster. The reason it's important for you to be buying these assets instead of just keeping your money in your bank account is because at the end of the day, when you're working to make money, you physically are working to make money. When you save money, your money is just sitting like this. It's flat. Your money isn't doing anything. The amount of money you have in your savings account today is going to be the same amount of money you have in a year, assuming you don't take any money out or put it in, right? So if your money is in your savings account, it's just sitting there. But you can't physically always be working, right? You want to live this life where you have other sources of income coming in. This is where assets come in. When you invest your money, you can see your money grow like this. It grows quicker than your money in your savings account, and it grows without you physically having to earn this money. You're using your money as a tool, kind of like a magnet, to go out and attract you more money. And if you want to attract more money, you need to be buying more assets. The more money you put in here, the more money you're going to get back. A simple rule of thumb to help you out with this if you want to build more wealth faster is to follow our five to one rule, which says for every $5 you spend on liabilities, spend $1 buying assets. If you spend $5 at Chipotle, spend $1 investing in Chipotle. If you spend $100 at Amazon, spend $20 investing in Amazon. Now, if you do want to learn more about money management and investing like this, that way you can grow your wealth faster, we have a free ebook on money management and investing that you can read for free when you sign up for our financial education emails, which are also free. You can get a free ebook and start reading our financial education emails by clicking the link up here or by clicking the link in the description below. By the way, our financial education emails are separate from our financial news emails. Fourth, you got to stop living this fake flex lifestyle. We're living in the day and age of social media where people live their lives based off of what they see on Instagram. Look, more than half the stuff you see on Instagram is fake. There are people that are going into debt to finance the perfect Instagram page because people are going into debt, borrowing money to buy things that way they look cool on Instagram. This has turned into a game of chicken where people are competing against each other to see who can go bankrupt first. Just because somebody has something doesn't mean they can afford it, okay? Remember the things that we talked about in this video? The majority of people are broke. Just because your friends are showing off the things that they just bought doesn't mean that they can afford to buy those things. Life doesn't have to be a competition. These big companies want it to be a competition because they know that if all your friends are competing against each other on what you own, you're going to be spending more money at these companies, but it doesn't have to be a competition. You don't need to go out and spend all your money and make every company around you rich. Use your money to build your wealth first. This brings me to number five. You got to understand the game. Okay, everybody in the world is after your money. Okay, this does not mean that businesses are evil or that they don't deserve to exist. This is just how the game works. Businesses want your money. Apple wants you to buy their AirPods. Lululemon wants you to buy their leggings. Chipotle wants you to buy their extra guac. What you need to do is create this filter. Okay, the whole world is asking you for your money. What you need to do is have this filter in place. That way you know what is worth spending money on and what is not spending money on. Because right now, what the majority of people do is they don't have this filter. When they see something they like, they just spend their money. They don't have this filter. You need to know what's worth spending money on and what's not worth your hard-earned money. The goal is not for you to live small for the rest of your life, okay? The goal is for you to live bigger and expand your means. But the only way you can do that is if you have more money for yourself, that way you can invest more money into yourself, that way you can have more money attracting you more money, and when you have that, that's when you can go out and live a bigger lifestyle. You can buy the nicer things, you can have the nicer car, you can have the bigger home. But in order to do that, you need to make sure you can afford it first. That way you're not stressing about the payments. The goal of the game is to become wealthy. That way you can buy all the nice things you want without worrying about the price. But you can never do that if every time you make a buck, it's constantly just going out. You need to know when it's worthwhile for you to part with your money. But this also goes both ways because once you understand the game and you understand how money works, that's when you're going to want to fuel your financial system because now you understand, okay, I need to use more of my money to buy assets, investments, which are things that pay me. And if you really want to ramp that up, then you're going to need more money coming into your financial system. That way you have more money to invest and you have more money to grow your wealth faster. 
And the only way you can do that is to come onto this side of the equation, the producer side of the equation, and learn how to create more income. This is gonna depend on what you like. Maybe you're just gonna work overtime at your job, you're gonna try to get a promotion, you're gonna try to get a raise, that way you can earn more money. For some of you, this might be starting a side hustle. Maybe you have a side cake business, maybe you become a freelancer, you just have this thing on the side that you do to earn more money, that way you can build your wealth faster. And for some of you, with the entrepreneurial bug, this is the opportunity for you to go out and understand how to create value, that way you can create a product that people need that improve people's lives. The name of the game is not spending money whenever you can and then trying to find steals or deals that are not actually deals. One time I was at the mall before this whole pandemic happened and there were these two girls in front of me in the line to check out and the cashier asked them, would you like a store credit card because you're gonna save 15% off your order. I forget which store this was now, maybe it was Macy's or JCPenney. And these two girls were like, yeah, that'd be great. And then the cashier starts looking up the credit information and these girls were literally praying that they would get approved for the store credit card. And when the cashier came back and said that you're approved, they literally started dancing with joy, right? When you have that, you are just being bombarded with these places, these companies that want your money and you're just giving it to them as soon as you have the opportunity. You gotta stop living like that. You need to understand the game. That way you can keep more money for yourself and build your wealth first. Everybody loves it when it's your payday. You love it when it's your payday, the Gucci store loves it when it's your payday, and even the government loves it when it's your payday because that means they get paid too. But what ends up happening to so many people is payday comes, you get excited, you start spending your money, and by the time next payday comes, you spend almost all of your money. Or maybe you decided to splurge on that extra guac and now you have no extra money. Sorry, Guaki. That's why in this video, I want to go over five things you need to stop doing when you get paid, starting with number one, when you get paid, stop wearing your money. See, the problem is most people have their priorities in the wrong place. Everybody says that they want to become wealthy, but most people will have no investments and no wealth, but then spend all their money on cars, clothes, and cute restaurants. The average new car payment at the time of me recording this video in America is $716 a month. Now, what does that mean? That means you're going out and you're financing this $50,000 car, paying $716 a month just to drive the car. This doesn't include insurance. It doesn't include maintenance. It does not include your premium gas, but you're paying $716 a month to finance this car. And in five years, this car is not gonna be worth $50,000. It might be worth $20,000 because your car is not an asset. Your car is a depreciating liability, meaning it is losing value every single day. I mean, the moment you stick your key in the ignition and you drive it off of the lot, it loses like 15 to 20 percent of its value right there. So now you're paying interest to drive this car, and this is $716 a month that's going directly to your car company that's making them richer. But what happens now if you play out this scenario? Five years from now, you're gonna go out and you're gonna realize you no longer have a car payment. So what most people end up doing is instead of now driving a car without a car payment, is now you gotta go ahead and get a new car because it's weird to have a car without a car payment. And so now every month for the next 35 years, you're driving around in a car and you're paying a car payment month after month after month. But if you don't own assets, if you don't own a rental property, if you don't own stocks worth as much as your car, your priorities in the wrong place. Because what happens now if instead of taking the $716 a month and putting it into your car, you take this money and you put it into the stock market and you're not trying to pick stocks, you're just throwing your money into the stock market and you do this for 35 years because you're gonna drive a car for the next 35 years as it is and you can get just an average, actually a little bit below average return of 7% a year. And yes, you can just put your money into an ETF in the stock market and get these types of returns. It doesn't mean that your money has to grow by 7% every year, but on average, we have seen the stock market grow by more than 7% a year over the last century. What does this mean? Well, after 35 years, you would have had $1.2 million, but instead you've got a car that's worth nothing. So now you gotta decide, would you rather have the million dollars or would you ever have a car that looks cool but really isn't worth much? That's the first C, cars. The second C are your clothes. Just take a look at the numbers. The CEO of Louis Vuitton, Bernard Arnault, is arguably the richest person in the world. How did he get so rich? because he's selling you the dream of wanting to be rich when in reality, he's the one that's actually getting rich when you're going out and you're buying the Louis Vuitton. And then you have the third C, which are the cute restaurants, because nowadays we live in a society where the phone eats first. 
So now what do you do? You go to restaurants, not based off of the food, not based off of how much you pay, but based off of what the aesthetics are that we can post on Instagram and show to all of our friends that don't really care. Hold on, Gwaki, let me take a picture really quick. Now make sure you hear me on this. There's nothing wrong with driving a luxury and exotic and expensive car. There's nothing wrong with wearing expensive clothes. There's nothing wrong with going to very expensive and nice restaurants. But there is something wrong with it if you're struggling with your money, if you don't have any investments, you don't have any cash flow, and now you're trying to spend all of your money on these places and then you're wondering why you're not wealthy. It's because your priorities are kind of misaligned here. The second thing I want you to stop doing when you get paid is stop letting your money die. This is a chart from the college investor showing the average annual returns by asset class between the years of 1985 to 2020. And what you'll see is that the investments or assets that provided the best returns were things like stocks and real estate and then even bonds. But at the very bottom of this list, you'll see cash, which provided the worst returns. Now I have the article down in the description if you want to read it, but that data ended at 2020, before we saw the huge run up in inflation in 2020, 2021, and into 2022, and even into 2023. So why is cash providing such a low return? Because the value of your cash, your savings is being devalued because of inflation. I mean, you've seen the prices of your rent, to your groceries, to your housing costs, to your travel costs, to your healthcare costs, to your car costs, everything has grown so much. And so now if you take your cash and you just save it, and it's sitting there and it's not growing, or it's not keeping up with the higher cost of living or the higher inflation, that means your savings are effectively making you poorer each and every day. And this is where, yeah, it's better to save your money than to dump it into a brand new car or into a Louis Vuitton shirt if you're trying to be financially smart. But this is where now there are better things that you can do with your money if you want to actually grow your money. That means if you're putting money aside to save it, you have taken the first step, which is great. But now you got to stop being scared with that money and you have to be willing to take risks with that money if you want to see your money grow and actually build your wealth. And that means taking some of that money and putting it into investments. And these investments can be stocks, it can be real estate, it can be into your own business idea. Now, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of how do you start investing in this video. I have tons of videos on that on my channel, but my team at Briefs Media put together this awesome ebook on how to build wealth as an investor that you can read for free. This ebook starts by talking about how do you build the mindset of an investor, and then it goes into how do you save the first couple thousand dollars, and then it goes into different ways to start investing your money, whether if you want to invest for cash flow, not for cash flow, how do you invest in stocks versus real estate, and then it goes into how do you spend your money smartly, and then it goes into how do you earn Earn your money smartly, then it goes into how do you protect your assets. This ebook is completely free. So if you want to read this ebook, I got the link to how you can download it for free down in the description below. Third, stop blindly following people on the internet. Which you talking about, Jasperi? You've seen people selling stock picks and get rich quick systems and simple systems to make a lot of money very quickly. But what I want to remind you here is that nothing worth having comes easy. Period. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Building wealth is hard. Period. Investing your money takes time. Period. You need money to invest. Period. And this is where you have to understand that if somebody's selling you this idea of how you can make six figures by doing nothing but sitting on the beach and working four hours a day, well, there might be something wrong with that because why isn't everybody else doing it? Now, here's some reality. Building wealth is very difficult. It takes a lot of work. It takes time. Building a business is hard work. It takes time. Maybe there are ways to do it without working hard, but I haven't been able to figure that out yet. The way that investing works is you got to earn money. Then you take money that you did not spend, which means you got to make some sacrifices. That's hard. And then you take the money that you didn't spend, and now you got to take this and put it into an investment. That's also hard because now you got to figure out where do you invest it? How do you invest it? What is investing? And that means it's also risky because there's a chance that you can lose your money because, of course, investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point. Every investor does. Now, the goal is to make more money than you lose, but you have to be willing to get over the mental hurdle of what happens if I lose $1,000 that I worked so hard to earn. But that's a part of the process because if you don't invest your money and you don't take that risk, you are never going to see the potential gains. Now, yeah, it sucks losing money, but that's a part of the process. And this is where now you have to be willing to invest in yourself. And if you keep just throwing money into these ideas that will hopefully give you these amazing returns without the effort, well, you're going to be making somebody else rich at your expense. And this is where it's very important for you to remember you worked hard to earn this money. You are going to be the one that works to protect it and grow it the most. Now, this doesn't mean you shouldn't get a financial advisor or a financial planner. They can be very helpful. However, 
You are the person that worked to grow this money. Don't just throw it into random places hoping that you're going to be able to turn rich by following this amazing advice that you found on the internet. You've got to be willing to trust your gut and understand that nothing worth having comes easy. This doesn't mean that all online education is bad. I mean, we have some amazing online education at Briefs Media where we go over things like how do you build wealth, but it's not easy. That's the key that you have to remember. The real secret to success is working hard, taking risks, learning, and keep getting back up. I think it was Dave Ramsey who originally said this, but there's a saying that goes, most people are spending money they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't even like. And if you're going out and buying things that you can't afford with money that you don't have, now not only are you buying something that's losing your money, but you have to spend tomorrow's income paying it back. I mean, we just saw in America credit card debt hit a brand new record high. What does that mean? That means people are spending money they don't have. And now when you spend money on your credit card, not only do you have to pay this money back, but you have to pay this money back plus interest. And the crazy thing is, you've probably heard of people talking about the credit card perks, credit card rewards, credit card benefits. I get those. I use a credit card for pretty much everything. I love spending with my credit card. I get a whole bunch of cash back, I get a whole bunch of rewards, I get a whole bunch of perks, but I've never paid a penny in interest on my credit card. And so if you are paying interest on your credit card, you're paying for everybody else's rewards and perks, not to mention all the perks and rewards for the credit card companies, because now when they're flying around in private jets, it's because you are paying for their interest. And this is where you have to make the conscious decision of understanding if I don't have the money to go out and buy something, I should not go out and put it on my credit card because when you put money on your credit card, you are essentially shackling yourself up. You are putting yourself into this financial prison where it is very difficult for you to get out of because I not only have to pay that money back, but you got to pay it back at 19% interest. And now if you're thinking, but just put it, I use buy now, pay later, so I'm not paying any interest. Well, I like to call buy now, pay later, broke now, broke later. And let's think about this for a second. If you went to the bank and you wanted to borrow money for six months, would they give it to you for free? No, they're going to charge you interest. Why does the bank charge you interest? Because there's a cost on borrowing money. So now if you use buy now, pay later, and they tell you that you have the 0% APR for a certain period of time, how is it that they can give you this money for free and still be one of the most profitable or money-making cash generating industries in fintech? How does that make any sense? Well, it's because the buy now, pay later companies know that if you go out and you buy something with buy now, pay later with 0% APR, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go out and buy more stuff because you don't feel any pain of seeing that $1,000 leave your account. It's only $45 leaving your account month after month after month. So now when you only see $45 leaving your account and you still got $955 in your account, now you can go out and buy something else. Maybe you go and buy a new sofa. Maybe you go and buy a new TV. Maybe you go and buy a new laptop because you still got some cash in your account. So number one is you go out and spend more things. And this has been scientifically and mathematically proven, which is why these buy now pay later companies make so much money. And then number two is they know that when you go out and you spend more money, you're also less likely to pay your stuff off in time. So now when you don't pay your stuff off in time, what happens? You get slapped with a brand new fine brand new fees. And now you're not paying 5 or 10% interest. Now you're paying 25 to 30% interest on your buy now, pay later, or as I like to call it, broke now, broke later, 0% APR financing. And number five is stop blowing your money, literally, on things like alcohol, drugs, and Netflix. Now the alcohol and drugs are kind of obvious. And I know this is easy for me to say, so I'll kind of give you that disclaimer here because I don't drink, I don't smoke. But if something is not adding value to your life, and it's sucking a lot of cash out of your life, you might want to start rethinking if that's something you really need in your life. And even in the business world, when I was getting started in the entrepreneurial space, a lot of people told me, how can you not drink? How are you going to make these business networks? How are you going to find people to want to work with you because everybody goes to these events and drinks? Well, what was interesting is I would go to these events and I would not drink. And then people would ask why I'm not drinking. And then I would stand up for myself and say, because I don't want to drink, I don't drink. And some people respected that, some people didn't, but I continued to do my own thing. And now I work on my terms, not their terms. So no, in the business world, you don't have to drink. You don't have to smoke. And I know it's a hard thing to leave, but if it's sucking a lot of money out of you, maybe that could be a financial reason for you to want to stop. But what about Netflix? How can you tie Netflix into alcohol and drugs? Well, with Netflix, 
it's not really a financial thing, it's a time suck. Because what ends up happening with Netflix is that the average American statistically is spending over two hours a day watching TV. What is TV? Netflix. And so now if you're spending $15 a month on this TV that you're spending two hours a day watching, the cost isn't the $15 a month. The cost is the two hours of time you are devoting to the TV every single day. That's 60 hours a month. We're talking about over 700 hours a year. If you took that 700 hours a year and you transfigured that time to read books, to learn about how to build wealth, to learn about how to increase your income, to start building your own business, in five years, you would be in a completely different financial space. So yes, Netflix can be a drug because when you're sucked into this idea of I have to come home and I have to unwind for a couple hours, I have to watch TV, I have to just kill brain cells, well, you are also killing your time. And the one asset that none of us can buy more of is time. That is the most valuable asset that everybody has. Rich people, poor people, middle class people, it does not matter. You cannot get more of it. If that is the most valuable asset that you have, and our time is slowly ticking away, do you want to spend that time sitting there watching TV? Or do you want to spend that time building your family's financial future? I'll let you decide. There's no right answer. And you can say whatever it is you feel is right for you. But I want you to think about that, especially when it comes to now, how do you grow your income? How do you grow your wealth? Well, if you have more time to grow your wealth, or you have more time to learn how to grow your wealth, that can completely change your and your family's financial future with just a few years worth of effort and devotion to it. Some of the richest Americans pay little to no money in taxes. We've all heard of President Donald Trump paying zero dollars in taxes, even though he's one of the richest people in the world. And Warren Buffett, who is one of the most successful investors of all time, talks about how he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary. And even if you move beyond the famous people, what you'll see is that rich people in general pay a lower tax rate than regular people. And you wanna know the craziest part? This is 100% legal. How do I know? Well, two reasons. For one, if it was not legal, all of these people would be in jail. And the second way that I know is because I've spent a lot of time studying the federal income tax code. And what I can tell you as an attorney, who is not your attorney, is that while the federal income tax code is over 2,000 pages long in this super small font, it really only tells you three things. Number one, it tells you how to categorize your gross income. Second, it tells you what deductions you can take from your gross income, which brings you to your taxable income. And then it tells you what is the tax rate on your taxable income. That's all you get from this 2000 pages. And then once you understand that, either you're gonna have a big tax bill or a small tax bill. See, what rich people are always trying to figure out is for one, how can I have little to no taxable income? And second, if I do have any taxable income, how can I have the lowest tax rate possible on this taxable income? There are four main ways that rich people do this. These are things that you can start doing right now too, but I do have to advise you that before you make any changes to your financial situation or your taxes, make sure you talk to a professional, an attorney, an accountant, somebody that can make sure that you're doing it right because you don't wanna run into issues or red flags with the IRS because that could end you up in a lot of trouble. The first thing that rich people do is to change the category of income that they get because not all income is taxed the same. Now everything that I discussed in this video is going to build on top of one another. So if you're serious about trying to see how you can lower your tax bill, make sure you watch this video until the end. If you made $100,000 and you went to an accountant and you asked them, what's the tax rate going to be on $100,000 worth of income? The first question that they're going to ask you is how did you make this money? Because if you made this $100,000 from a job, you're going to have one tax rate. If you made this $100,000 from your stock market investments, it's going to have a completely different tax bill. And if you made this $100,000 from your real estate investments, it's going to have a different tax bill. If you go to work every single day and you get paid a paycheck as a W-2 employee, this is called ordinary, otherwise known as earned income. If you sold a stock and you made a $100,000 profit and you own the stock for longer than a year, this is called portfolio income and you pay long-term capital gains. If you made $100,000 in cash flow from your real estate investments, this is called passive income in the eyes of the IRS. Do you want to know which of these three different types of income has the highest tax rates, meaning the highest tax brackets, and the lowest deductions? This one right here, your ordinary income, the money you make from your job. The money you make from what you do comes with the highest tax rates and the lowest tax deductions. The money you make from what you own comes with lower tax rates and it also comes with higher tax deductions. 
So the first thing that every wealthy person tries to do, which is something that anybody can do, is they work to recategorize their income. They don't just work for this ordinary income, they invest their money into assets, that way they can earn this type of income. Portfolio income is when you own an investment and you sell it for profit. This is like your stock market investment income, assuming you own your investments for longer than a year. And your passive income is things like rental checks for your real estate properties. This is a different type of investment income and it comes with this own set of tax deductions. So wealthy people are working to move their income from here to here because this comes with bigger tax breaks, not to mention the fact that when you own an asset, it also requires less time than going to work every single day. So if we come back to this tax chart, what we just talked about is changing your tax rate because now when you recategorize your income, you have the ability to pay a lower tax rate legally. The second thing that wealthy people do is they lower their taxable income. So the question here is how do you lower your taxable income? Because you're not taxed on your gross income, you're taxed on your taxable income. This is the gross income minus all of your deductions. This is what your taxable income is and this is where it pays to have a good accountant on your side because a good accountant's job is to help you find the most amount of deductions and write-offs possible. That way you have the lowest taxable income possible because when you have the lowest taxable income, Income, that means you're going to have a lower tax rate as well. Now, for the majority of people who work a job, if you are a W-2 employee, the way that it works for you is like this. You make money from your job, then you might get the standard deduction, which is what the IRS offers to everybody. And then after the standard deduction, you pay your taxes. And then this is the money that you have left over to go out and spend. This is the money that you can use to buy a car, to buy a home, to go out on vacation. This is the money that you have to do that, your post-tax income. But if you own a business, this could be a real estate investment business, this could be a business that you created, this could be a business that you bought, now this is completely flipped. Now the way that it works is you make money from your business, then you pay your expenses right here, and then you pay taxes on whatever is left. Because now these expenses are deductions that you can take against your gross income, which is why you have a much slower tax liability, a lower taxable income, because you're paying for your expenses first. Now the question is, what can these expenses be? Well, these expenses have to be used inside of your business to help grow your business, but this again is where the help of an accountant is going to become so important that we can classify the right expenses, that we can use as many expenses and deductions as possible. I own a business. I need a laptop to run my business. So my laptop was an expense that I get to deduct from my income before paying taxes. I need a phone from a business. So I deducted my iPhone from my income. I had to go to San Diego last year. I had to go to Manhattan last year. I spent about two months in San Diego and about a month, month and a half in Manhattan last year. Both of those were expenses. I got to expense my travel, my flight, my Airbnb, my meals. All these things were expenses that I got to deduct from my income before my taxable income. Now, if I didn't own a business and I wanted to go to Manhattan, well, now I have to spend that money with my post-tax income. I make money, I pay taxes, and then whatever's left, I have to use to fly to Manhattan. If I wanted to go to San Diego, the same thing. If I wanted to buy a cell phone, same thing. If I wanted to buy a laptop, same thing. Here, if I needed to buy a truck for my business, if it classifies under the right exemptions, because there are deductions out there right now that will allow you to deduct the value of a heavy vehicle against your income. So if I went out and bought a $150,000 G-Wagon, I could deduct most of the value of the G-Wagon against my income. Now again, I have to justify that I'm using it in my business, but this is where now clever accounting comes into play. Like last year, my accountant kept telling me to buy a G-Wagon. Why a G-Wagon? Because he said that we could justify that if I bought a G-Wagon, he could say to the IRS, look, Jaspreet is an influencer. He needs to maintain his image as an influencer. How can he do that? Well, he can buy a G-Wagon, and now this G-Wagon is a tax deduction for him. Now, did I buy a G-Wagon? No, because for me, I don't want to go out and just spend my money to spend it, not to pay money in taxes. I'd rather pay a little bit of money in taxes and have more money at the end of the year rather than go out and buy something that I don't need. But this is where fancy accounting can come into play if you have a good accountant, because now you can use a tax code which is written by the IRS and now you can use the code to your advantage, but you have to understand how it works. Now, I am not an expert in the tax code. 
but I have hired an expert in the tax code. I have hired an accountant whose sole job is to study the tax code, study the deductions, stay up to date on what's happening, and then tell me what I can do in terms of tax planning so I know how to spend my money and different ways for me to now use my money. That way I can pay less money in taxes legally. Remember this, it's not how much money you make that matters, it's how much money you keep. If a doctor, a stock market investor, and a business owner all made a million dollars in a year, they're not all going to keep the same amount of money after taxes. The doctor might be paying 40 to 50% of that money in taxes because that's ordinary income and you have the least deductions. Now, the amount of money you're going to actually pay is going to depend on what state that you live in, what state taxes you have, but you might have to pay 400 to $500,000 that year in taxes, meaning you're left with 500 to $600,000 worth of your income. It's a lot of money, but nowhere near the million dollars that you earned. The stock market investor earned portfolio income, which means you get the benefit of a lower tax rate, which means the top tax rate for you is 20%, meaning you're going to be paying about $200,000 in taxes. You still made a million dollars, but you get to keep $800,000 out of that million. And third, now you have the business owner who made a million dollars. Now, if the business owner made a million dollars, but had no other deductions, that was their profit, that's their taxable income, they're going to pay the same tax rate as the doctor, that four hundred dollars to $500,000 in taxes. However, you have the ability now to harvest debt that the doctor couldn't do. And this means that you'll have the ability to keep money in your bank account and not have to pay taxes on all that money. Now, there are two ways for you to use debt as a business owner to earn money and not pay any money in taxes legally. But I got to give you a little bit of a disclaimer here because anytime you use debt, you increase the risk. You increase the risk of you failing. You increase the amount of expenses that you have because no, no matter what happens, even if your business starts to struggle, you still got to make your debt payments. So anytime you increase the debt, you increase the risk and you increase the chance of failure. So don't do this for the purpose of just saving money in taxes unless you really understand the risk, unless you understand the issues that could happen with debt, and unless you fully understand that, don't use debt. I personally don't do these strategies because for me, I don't want to go out and just take on debt to save money in taxes. If I was to use debt, I want to use it strategically to help grow the business. So just understand that the debt increases risk. Option number one is to follow the Elon method, which is now where you don't take out an income from your business, but rather you use debt to finance your lifestyle. So one of the things that Elon made really popular was the fact that he doesn't earn an income, a salary income from Tesla. He gets paid in stock options. What that means is he owns a lot of Tesla stock, billions and billions of dollars worth of Tesla stock, but this isn't cash in his bank account. So now if he wanted to actually receive any cash, he had two options. He could one, go out and sell this Tesla stock, but as soon as he sold this Tesla stock, he'd have a huge taxable income because he created Tesla. So his basis in the Tesla stock is very low. So if he sold his Tesla stock for a huge profit, which is what he'd be doing, he'd have a big taxable income. Option number two is he can refinance out of his Tesla stock. He can use debt against the value of his Tesla stock and use his debt to pay for his lifestyle because debt isn't taxable. It's easier to understand this with bigger numbers, so let me just explain what this means. Let's assume now that you own a business making $1 million a year. If your business is making $1 million a year, it might be worth somewhere between $10 million and $20 million, 10 to 20 times multiple, depending on what industry your business is and what your business does. So your business is worth 10 to $20 million. Now the question is, how can you realize the value of this business and use this value of your business without actually selling your business? Because if you sold your business today for 10 to $20 million, you're going to have a big tax bill. But if you just took out debt against the value of your business, now this debt isn't taxable and you also still own your business. So if you go to the bank and you say, hey bank, I have a business worth $10 million. Would you be willing to loan me $1 million? Most banks, assuming you go to the right one, are going to say yes. So now you go to the bank and you take out a $1 million loan because the bank wants to give you money because they see the value of your business. And if you don't pay a loan, well now the bank will get a 10 to $20 million business. So most banks want this deal because if you fail, they're going to win big time. So this is why banks would be willing to loan you $1 million. Now you have a million dollars in your pocket tax free, because now if you were to go and refinance your home, that refinance, that debt that you get, that isn't taxable, debt isn't taxable. So you're just pulling cash out tax-free with debt, and now you have a million dollars to spend. 
Now you can use this million dollars to buy a home, you can buy a car, you can buy food, and you can live your life, and you don't have to pay any money in taxes. Now you might be saying, but now how are you going to pay back this debt? Because everybody has to pay back this debt, right? Well, the question now is, what are you going to do with your business? Because if you can keep growing your business, maybe in a few years your business isn't worth 10 to 20 million, it's worth 50 to 60 million. Now what you can do is you can say, hey bank, how about you give me another $5 million now because my business is worth five times more. Now you have more money, you use this more debt to pay back this debt, and you start to play this debt game where you pay back your old debt with new debt. Now if you keep doing this until you die, you win. But the risk here is what happens if your business fails? What happens if your business doesn't grow? What happens now if you run into financial struggles? You can start to see where the risk is, but this is a way now for you to use debt as a way to finance your lifestyle without having to pay any money in taxes because you're not taking any money out from your business. You're using debt to finance whatever you're doing using the value of your business as security. The value of your business is the collateral. And you're using that to get a loan, which is why now this loan is tax-free. You use this money to live your life, but you only have to pay taxes if you actually pull money out. If you have taxable income and debt is not taxable income. The second way to use debt would be to buy bigger deductions. Let me give an example. So let's assume now that you own a business and this business makes $100,000 of profit this year. This would be a taxable income, assuming that you have no other deductions. But let's assume now that you want to go out and you want to buy that G-Wagon and you want to be able to deduct this G-Wagon against your income. Well, if a G-Wagon costs, let's just say $100,000, well, that means you're going to be out all of your cash if you buy the G-Wagon with cash. Well, option number two is you put down $20,000 and now you finance the other $80,000. If you were to finance the other $80,000, now you only put down 20 grand, which means you still have 80 grand in your bank account. And now you have a G-Wagon, but now you also get the tax write-off for the entire G-Wagon. Now let's assume that you use 80% of the G-Wagon for your business and you use 20% of the G-Wagon for your personal life. Meaning sometimes you take this G-Wagon and you go to the movies, you hang out with your friends, you do other things. So the G-Wagon is primarily business use and some of it is for your personal life. Now what you get is an 80% deduction on the value of the G-Wagon against your taxable income. 80% of the $100,000 G-Wagon is an $80,000 deduction against your taxable income. So now you get an $80,000 deduction against your $100,000 income, meaning you only have $20,000 worth of taxable income but you have $80,000 in your bank account. Remember, you didn't buy this G-Wagon with the $100,000 in your bank account. You bought this with a loan, you used debt. So you put down $20,000, which is why you have 80 grand in your bank account. You use the other $80,000 from the bank's money to buy the G-Wagon, but you still get to deduct 80% of the value of the G-Wagon or $80,000 against your income. But this is where things really get fun because now what happens if you buy something for your business but you don't have enough income to support the value of your deduction. Let me show you what I mean. By the way, if you are an entrepreneur and you want to stay up to date on the latest business trends, you want to know what's happening with the latest innovation trends, that's why I created Business Briefs. It's a completely free resource for entrepreneurs to keep you up to date on what's happening in the business and entrepreneurship world. You can read it at less than five minutes every morning and every day my team is covering the latest innovation trends, the latest business trends, and the latest in funding trends. You can read it for free and I'll put the link to how you can join Business Briefs for free down in the description below. So let's assume that you want to buy G-Wagon, but you don't make $100,000 a year, you only made $25,000 a year. Now, I'm not going to recommend anybody do this, I'm just talking about how the taxes work, and I'm talking about how debt works when it comes to taxes. Okay, so take this for what it's worth. You made $25,000 this year in your business. Nice. Now, you want to go out and ball out with a G-Wagon, but you don't have $100,000 to buy this G-Wagon with cash. So what do you do? You put down $20,000 to buy this $100,000 G-Wagon and you finance the other $80,000. Now, you will get that same $80,000 deduction. But how are you going to write off $80,000 of a deduction when you only have $25,000 worth of income? Because now you subtract this $25,000 that you could, now you have $0 of taxable income, but you still have a lot of money left over in this deduction. Well, now you have a loss because now you get to tell the IRS, okay, I didn't actually have any taxable income 
In fact, I had a $55,000 loss in my business because, well, I had to go out and buy this G-Wagon. Now, again, this doesn't mean that you have negative $55,000 in your bank account. You still have five grand in your bank account because you financed this G-Wagon. So you have $5,000 in your bank account right now. You tell the IRS that you have a $55,000 loss because you could deduct 80% of the value of this G-Wagon. Now, next year, you might make a little bit more money. Let's assume next year that you made $35,000 in your business. Nice. Well, now you tell the IRS, hey IRS, I made $35,000 in my business this year. But last year, I lost $55,000. So now you deduct this against this, and again, you have $0 of taxable income because now you had $35,000 of profit, which is in your bank account. This plus this means you have $40,000 in your bank account, but again, $0 with the taxable income because you get to carry forward this loss. Then the year after that, you get to take the leftover from this loss on your income again. Now you can start to see how some business owners will be able to use debt strategically to carry forward losses against their income. And this can get much bigger when the dollars are bigger too. It doesn't have to be cars, it doesn't have to be planes. You can buy machinery, you can buy other equipment for your business. You could potentially buy real estate strategically. There's other rules with real estate, which will now allow you to deduct the value of the asset that you bought from your income, show a loss on taxes, even though you have cash in your bank account, even though you're making a profit on paper. You have cash, you're making a profit, but you have a taxable loss. And now you can take this taxable loss and move it forward every single year, as long as the IRS said so, but you can keep moving forward this loss, which means you make a profit. You have more cash in your bank account, but you owe no money in taxes legally. Let me give you another fun example. Let's assume that you made $2 million this year from your business. This is the profit, this is the cash in your bank account. Now, if you just left this money as it is, you don't have any other deductions, you're gonna have a pretty big tax bill because you have $2 million of income, that's a big tax bill. But now if you were to go out and buy, let's just say a $20 million plane, well now, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna put down $2 million to buy this $20 million plane and you're gonna finance the other 18 million. So this is $18 million worth of debt. And now the IRS has some special tax provisions on planes, which will allow you to deduct pretty much the entire plane this year which means now you get to tell the IRS, hey, I made $2 million minus these deductions, which is this $20 million plane that I just bought, even though you only put down $2 million. So that means you have negative $18 million in taxable income. Now next year, if you made $4 million, you just carry forward this loss. And the year after that, you can carry forward the loss again. And you do that again and again and again. And then maybe you could sell this plane for $20 million. Maybe you sell it for a profit. Maybe you sell it for a little bit of a loss, but you're making money every year and you're paying little to no money in taxes. And this is completely legal. Again, this is why it pays to have a good accountant. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a plane. This doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a G-Wagon. There's so many other ways to do this. Just planes and G-Wagons are fun to talk about, but there's so many other ways to do this, which is why you wanna make sure you have a good accountant on your side. That way you understand the different deductions that are possible, that way you can actually use them. This is what strategic tax planning is because tax planning is all about understanding the different ways that you can spend money. That way you can have cash in your bank account and pay little to no money in taxes legally. Now, of course, when it comes to debt, you have to understand debt comes with its own risks. Our economy goes through highs and lows, meaning you have to predict that there are gonna be times where your business will also go through highs and lows. And so if you use debt, you have expenses that never go away. And so you have to factor that in there. So don't just go out and take on a whole bunch of debt because, well, you don't want to pay any money in taxes. Understand the risks with that because debt has its own risks. This is where you want to be financially smart, but then you also want to be tax smart. The difference between a rich person, a middle-class person, and a poor person financially is that a poor person buys dumb things with other people's money. A middle-class person buys dumb things with their hard-earned money, and a rich person buys dumb things with easy earn money. Let me explain. See, what the average person does, the middle class person, is they are working to make money to do one thing, buy nicer things. The average person is working harder to drive a better car, to earn a bigger home, and to go on nicer vacations. Poor people 
People who are not financially successful want the nice stuff. Everybody does. And when you don't have the nice stuff or when you can't afford it, what do you do? You put it on your credit card. Now you're having somebody else pay for that stuff. And now you have to spend the rest of your life paying off the Gucci, paying off the vacations, paying off the car. And so now you're playing this payments game where you have some of the nice stuff, but you're not buying it with your hard-earned money. You have to pay it back with your hard-earned money. But what rich and wealthy people do is they still buy the nice stuff, but they're not using their hard-earned money to buy that stuff. They're using their easy-earned money to buy that stuff. And what I mean by that is they go and generate an income, whether it's at their job or whether it's at their business. It does not matter. You go to generate this income. Then you take this income, and instead of going out and buying a new car, buying whatever stuff you want, you go out and you buy assets, something like rental properties, something like dividend-paying stocks, something that pays you with cash flow. Maybe it's even businesses. You make money, you buy assets, and then these assets will produce an income. And if it's in the form of cash flow, now you produce a new stream of income that's paying you every month, every quarter, every year. And then they use the money that their assets pay them to then go out and buy that dumb stuff. So what is a dumb item? Well, dumb things are things that do not put any money in your pocket. Your clothes, your shoes, your cars, your vacations, your home. All these are dumb expenses. Now, I'm not saying don't buy any dumb expenses. I'm saying if you want dumb stuff, make sure you can afford it. Because all these things are known as liabilities. Liabilities are things that take money out of your pocket and don't put any money back. Assets are things that you buy for the purpose of making money. And what wealthy people want to do is they want to make money to buy assets and then use these assets to buy liabilities. What the average person is doing is they're making money and then they're using this money to buy liabilities. And then what poor people, financial poor people are doing is they're making money and then they're financing these liabilities. Now, when I talk about your home, the reason why I talk about your home as this liability is because most people believe that your home is the biggest investment ever. If you are a realtor, you've probably taught this. This is what I was taught when I went through my realtor training. Mortgage brokers will tell you the same thing. But the reality is your home is only an asset if you can sell it for a profit. But until you sell it for a profit, when you buy that home, not only do you have to make the mortgage payments, but you also have to pay for all the upgrades. You have to pay for all the maintenance. You have to pay for the property taxes. You have to pay for the insurance. You have to pay for the HOA. And you have to pay for anything else to take care of the property. And then you have to hope that you can sell it for a profit, which maybe you will be able to, maybe you won't be able to. We have seen the real estate market go up and down. 10 years ago, we were in a very down real estate market. Today, we are in a up real estate market. So real estate goes to cycles just like every other asset class. And if you are in a neighborhood or you're in an economic cycle that happened to be hurt when it comes time for you to sell and you have to sell it, you might end up losing money, especially when you factor in all the other costs that you had to pay to maintain that home. Now, I'm not saying buying a home is bad. I'm not saying that you shouldn't own a home. What I'm saying is if you want to buy a home, fine. Just make sure you can afford it first because what ends up happening to so many people is they go out and buy a home thinking that this home is going to make them wealthy, that one day I'm going to pay down this home and pass it on. That's going to be my generational wealth, which is okay, but that's one of the worst forms of generational wealth that you can have because if you are sacrificing your ability to actually invest money, just so you can make a mortgage payment, you're buying a home the wrong way. This home is now a liability for you because now you no longer have the ability to go out and buy rental properties. You no longer have the ability to go out and invest in stocks. You no longer have the ability to go out and buy businesses or whatever it is that you want. It does not matter what investment you want to buy. But now if you're living paycheck to paycheck because you got to worry about making the mortgage payment, well, now you're doing it the wrong way. And this is where everybody says, well, I'm building equity in my home. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. Did you know that your mortgage payments are front-loaded, meaning if you go out and buy a home today with a mortgage, most of your mortgage payment is going to be going to interest in your bank's pocket today and tomorrow and the month after that and the month after that and the year after that and the year after that and the year after that. For the first about 14 years of your mortgage, the majority of your mortgage payment is going to be going directly into your banker's pocket with interest 
and not equity. It's about 14 and a half years into your mortgage, your 30-year mortgage, that now at least half of your mortgage payment is going to be going to your principal. So for the first almost half of your 30-year mortgage, most of your monthly payment is going just to interest. It takes about 15 years before you start making any significant contribution to your actual equity balance or the majority of your payment going to the equity balance in your home. Is it bad to buy a home? No. But do not stretch yourself too thin to go out and buy a home because what I would rather you do is I would rather see you stretch yourself thin to go out and buy more assets, to buy more investments, because that's what's going to make you wealthier in the long run. I met a guy at this conference that I was at recently, and he was talking to me about this problem that he had. He said, I'm running into a lot of financial difficulties, but they are very unique financial difficulties. I said, tell me more. He says that I am a very aggressive investor. I said, I like the sound of that. He says, I invest pretty much every dollar that I possibly can into cash flow producing assets like dividend paying stocks. I said, I like the sound of that. He said, the problem is, I sometimes don't have enough money to eat. He's like, I came to this conference and I didn't have any money to pay for my parking meter. But at the same time, I got a notification on my brokerage that I got a dividend payment this morning. I said, well, you've already tackled the most difficult problem because the most difficult problem for most people is getting that mindset to invest and then taking action to put your money to work and staying significant staying aggressive on it. Your problem now is you got to figure out how you can make more money because what you've been doing is focused on just squeezing more pennies out of this pie, where if you make $50,000 a year, you save and invest $10,000. Now you're spending 40, you're saving and investing 10,000. And then what happens to a lot of people is you say, wow, I like this investing thing. I like this idea of being able to build my wealth and grow my savings and grow my net worth. I want to do more. So what do you do? Instead of saving and investing $10,000, now you do $15,000, maybe $20,000. Now again, you're making $50,000 a year. Now, if you're saving and investing $20,000, you're only living off of $30,000, but you're investing a little bit more. It takes time for your money to compound and really grow, but there's a limit to how many pennies you can squeeze out of this limited pie. Because at the end of the day, a penny saved is just a penny. And once you understand this, this is a good problem to have because now the next part is where things get really fun because now what you want to do is focus on the income side. This is what we were talking about earlier. How can you take this from $50,000 to $500,000? Because now if you follow the same ratio, you can now live off of $300,000 and save and invest $200,000. You're saving and investing way more, but you also have way more money to spend. And this is where now that financial education is so important to understand. Number one, the key to becoming wealthy is to not spend your hard-earned money buying dumb things. Meaning, do not spend your hard-earned money to buy things that are losing you money. Use your assets to buy things that will lose you money. If you want to buy nice things like a watch, fancy car, fancy vacations, good. It's a motivation for you. But use your money smartly. The more aggressive you can be to buy these assets, to buy the cash flow, the sooner that you will be able to afford the crazy stuff, the fun stuff, the dumb stuff without having to worry about the money. Now, does this mean you have to wait completely until you can buy it with your cash flow? No, not necessarily. But you have to make sure you're investing your money first. And this is where you got to figure out where on the spectrum are you. Are you going to be one of those people that's going to go all in and invest every penny possible and eat rice and beans until you can start making some real cash flow? Or are you going to start by making $100 a month into your investments? It doesn't matter where you start, but the key is that you have to get started. And this is where now you have to know where do you want to go? Because once you know how to get there, the question is where do you want to go? Because now you know wealthy people are working to have their assets pay for their lifestyle. Because now, even if you buy a whole bunch of dumb things, you got another check coming in next month, and the month after that, and the month after that, and this is money coming in without you even having to work. But in order to get that, you need the money to invest. So where do you get that money? Well, again, you can work through your job, or you can work to create your own income. But the key is that you have to be working to scale that income. That way you have more money to invest because the more money you have to invest, the more income you're going to be able to get from your investments. If you want to be a high earner or a high achiever, it starts with your mindset. 
And what I want to do now is go over 10 mindset shifts that you can start making today that all high achievers are doing. And number one is the blue ocean mindset shift. There's a book out there that I highly recommend you read called The Blue Ocean Strategy. And what The Blue Ocean Strategy talks about, this is mainly in terms of entrepreneurship, but you don't have to apply this to entrepreneurship. You can do this even if you work a job. But what The Blue Ocean Strategy is, it says that the majority of businesses out there are operating in what's called a red ocean. It's a bloody ocean where businesses are competing against each other to do the exact same thing. People are just trying to make a little bit of a better mousetrap where you're selling the same product that somebody else does or a copy of somebody else's product. Maybe you try to compete on price. Maybe you try to compete on speed, but you're competing on little things where essentially you have the same business as somebody else. You are direct competitors and you're trying to undercut the other competitor. So you have this limited market share, this market space. And now the companies there are working head to head for the exact same market share, the exact same market space, and it's a bloody competition to essentially the bottom. And what the Blue Ocean Strategy is, it's how can you go from this bloody red ocean to a blue ocean where you have a wide range of opportunities and little to no competition? This is what the Blue Ocean Strategy is. An example of this Blue Ocean Strategy at work would be comparing the old blockbuster and family video where you had all these movie stores that were competing against one another for your Friday night movie rentals. And then came along Netflix, another DVD rental business. But instead of having a place where you would go to rent a DVD like every other DVD rental business out there, they started off by mailing you the DVDs and then they started investing in their own technologies to create a movie streaming model. A completely different business model than all the traditional movie rental businesses out there. They created their own market share. They created their own business strategy. They were selling the same thing, movies, but through a whole new market because now they created a whole new market of people who wanted to stream or get access to movies on their own terms instead of going to the blockbuster, instead of going to family video. And it was a whole new business model and they eliminated all their competition. A completely different business model of doing something different. So now, if you want to be a high achiever, the question is not how do you go out and build the next Netflix, but how can you play a game that isn't competing against everybody else doing what everybody else is doing because if you do what everybody else does, you're fighting for a small pie. But if you can start innovating and hustling a little bit smarter, now the question is how can you create your own success doing something a little bit different? So if you have your own business, the question is how do you create your own blue ocean? And if you are working to build your own wealth, again, this is the same thing, thinking differently than everybody else. Everybody is working to get a paycheck so they can drive a bigger and fancier car. But if you really want to have the bigger and fancier car without having to worry about the price, you got to create your own income. And if you don't want to go out and create your own business, that means you got to go out and invest in other investments, other assets that will pay you that way now your assets can pay for your car. The second mindset shift that you have to make is going from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Most of us, most people, have a scarcity mindset where we think there's a limited amount of money in the world, there's a limited amount of happiness in the world, and so if somebody else is successful, if somebody else has money, if somebody else is happy, I should hate them because they're taking away the limited amount of success or winnings in the world. When in reality, there's a lot of money in the world and there's no limit to how much happiness that's in the world. Like, you can be happy and I can be happy. But the problem is, when somebody is unhappy, it's very happy to be happy for other people who are happy. Just like that, when somebody is broke, it's very hard for a broke person to be happy for somebody who did get that money. But this is where, again, it starts with that mindset. There's no limit. There's no scarcity of money. There's a lot of money in the world. Yeah, do some people have a lot of that money? Sure. But there's no limit to you getting a piece of that money too. What you have to do is figure out how can you create some value that we can get a small little piece of the money that's in the world. And just like that, happiness is an abundance as well. Now, this is not a mental health channel or topic, but if you're struggling emotionally, you're struggling with anxiety, depression, you're struggling to feel happy, it's not a money thing. More money is not going to make you more happy. More money gives you access to do things that will make you happy-er, but if you're not happy, 
You got to go figure out what it is that's making you unhappy. And if you have something deep down, you have issues, mental issues, go get that taken care of. Talk to a therapist, talk to a psychiatrist, talk to a psychologist, do whatever it takes to take care of that because one of the most painful things that I've seen people realize is that more money is not the solution to make you happier. And when you chase money to chase happiness and then you get that money, but you don't get the happiness, you get an even deeper and darker hole inside of you. And that's where you got to understand that if you want to be happy, that's different than getting money. More money can allow you to do more things that make you happier, but it's not just going to make you happy all by itself. Number three is the work to learn, not the work to earn mindset. And this is a big mistake that so many people make is that they work to get jobs solely for the purpose of making money, solely for you to go out and buy the nice things. But if you really want to be able to scale yourself, whether it's in your career or in your business, you have to be willing to work to learn, not just to work to earn. That means you have to be willing to go out and maybe get a job where you're not making as much money as you were before, but because you're going to learn a skill, you're going to learn something, you're going to learn a value, a skill that is scalable that you can apply somewhere else. Or maybe you're going to work in a company or in a place where you have more scalability, but it requires you to build the long-term mindset of now I'm working not just to get a paycheck. And this is so hard because most of us are taught when you go get a job to just look at the paycheck. How much money are you making? What is the salary? But real wealth, if you really want to build wealth, that means you're going to have to work to learn, not just to work to earn. One of our newest hires here at Briefs Media talks about this all the time because he talks about all the crap that he had to go to in other places because he didn't know anything about digital marketing, digital business, and he would work for these other brands just to learn. He started off, he got roles with big digital brands because he offered to work there for free. He got his foot in the door. Then he got to meet other players in the game and he offered to work for very cheap. And he had to make a lot of sacrifices to do that. But the reason why he did that wasn't so he could make a lot of money in those positions, but so he could learn. That way he could then go to the next person, to the next brand and show, hey, this is what I've done. I've done X, Y, and Z. I've learned these things. I've learned digital marketing. I learned how to work with people. I learned how to advertise. I learned how to sell things. I learned how to work with brands. And now because I've done all of this, I've built up this huge resume of skills and experience. Now he has the ability to earn way more money because he was willing to work to learn first. Four is building a long-term mindset. And this one is so difficult because when you grow up with this idea of instant gratification, it becomes extremely difficult for you to see any real success in life because now all you want and all you see is that instant success. You see people who became rich overnight and you wonder, why can't you have that too? And then that's what you start doing. You start to follow the get rich quick schemes and systems. Now, maybe you throw your money into a meme stock, think you're going to get rich. And then as soon as you buy, that's the stock that goes down. You find a cryptocurrency that's on the way to explode, you buy it, you make a little bit of money for a few weeks, and then it implodes and you lose your money. You find a new course or system that's going to show you how to make six figures in six months. You buy the class and two weeks later, you stop taking it and you realize this is not going to teach you anything valuable. Your money is lost there. It's a game where you constantly keep getting lost in that track when in reality, real wealth is built over the long term over any sort of whatever you want to call it. I mean, with your investments, investors will beat out the traders over the long term. Traders might win in the short term, but the investors are going to win time and time again over the long term. But that requires you to be investing into an asset for years, if not decades. Building a business is a lot more profitable than starting a quick side hustle that's going to make you a lot of money. But it takes a lot more dedication and sacrifice and risk today to do that. Learning from a class that's going to teach you how to build wealth or invest your money isn't going to be as attractive as six figures to six months, but you might actually learn a skill like real estate investing or money management or building a business or other skills that will allow you to actually scale your income, but it's not going to be as attractive as everything else. And this is where, unfortunately, getting rich quick is a lot more attractive than getting rich slowly. But getting rich slowly is a lot more of a surefire way to actually get rich. 
And again, if you want to get rich faster, you got to put in more effort, you got to put in more work, got to take up more risk and try more things in order to do it. But ultimately, you have to have the long-term mindset of, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, whether it takes one month, 10 months, or 10 years to go out and get there because it's a lifestyle change as opposed to just, I'm going to do this for six months and see what happens. Number five is you got to adapt the growth mindset. And this one is so hard because many of us, or a lot of people in general, like to count other people's pennies and they're more worried about what other people are getting rather than what they get themselves. And what you'll see is that people are so focused on what other people are getting that they would rather you not become successful than they become successful themselves. And you see this in so many different industries in so many different ways. I remember when I was in college, I was working as a realtor. I was working with these clients who wanted to buy this home. They were very difficult clients. Show them home after home after home after home after home. Finally, found them this home that they loved, that they liked, that was within all of the specifications. We're ready to make the offer. We're working on the contract. And I don't know how many weeks or months this is into us working. And the husband and wife who wanted to make this offer sit me down and they said, Just breathe. Okay, we want to put this in, this in the contract. There's only one thing. I said, what's that? They said, we want you to put half of your commission into the deal. We want you to give us half of your commission. I said, why? Again, I was in college. I think I was going to make about twelve dollars to $15,000 in commission on this one deal. And they said, we don't think that a 20-year-old deserves this much of a commission, uh, so we want you to put give us half, essentially. Now, I was a hardhead back then. I didn't really negotiate or talk, and I said, nope, you can do it yourself. And I walked away. They were more worried about what I was going to make as a broker, as a realtor in this deal. They knew exactly what my commission structure was. Before we even began working together, they had to sign paperwork, which said that I was going to split the commission with uh, whoever the sellers were for the property. The money wasn't coming out of their pocket. It was coming out of the seller. So they knew exactly what was happening, but they waited until the last minute because they felt like I shouldn't be making twelve to 15000 off of that one deal. Well, I walked away, and they lost the ability to get that home. And so this is that growth mindset of now understanding I need to focus on me, not what everybody else is, and I can have more. It's, it goes hand in hand with that abundance mindset that I can have more money. I can have more success. I can have more happiness. And me being successful is not going to hinder somebody else from becoming successful. You can become successful and I can become successful. You can be happy and I can be happy. You can be healthy and I can be healthy. There's no limit and this is that growth mindset of, wow, we can all win, but I have to be able to believe that we can all win. And this is that, it's just a different way of thinking when you start to realize, wow, being a hater doesn't do any good for anybody. It doesn't help them, it doesn't help me. In fact, being a hater might help them and it might hurt me. So me hating on somebody else might give them more fuel to want to succeed while it just keeps me in this negative, like just toxic environment that I'm swimming in and I'm creating that toxic environment myself. Number six is ignore what other people think. And this is so difficult for so many reasons because you know, I can tell you from the traditional Indian culture, this whole idea, what will other people think? I mean, every immigrant brown kid has heard their mom and their aunt and their grandma and maybe their grandfather and their parents and their dad talk about how, oh, what are other people going to think if we do this? What are other people going to think if you act like this? What are other people going to think if you wear this? This is like one of those things. This is one of those sayings that you just hear again and again and again. In Punjabi, they say, oh, ki kyanage, loka ki kyanage. That's the way that they say it in Punjabi. And it's one of those things you're, you're so bred to hear that you're always worried about what other people will think. And I heard it so many times that I became so fed up with it that I stopped caring completely. That I was like, you know what? Let me go out and give people a reason to talk about me. I, it's, you get so fed up with that. And when it comes to money, what other people think, oh my God, people love talking. This is what, again, people, this is what they do. But this is not going to pay your bills. People love talking about you. But it's them talking about you is not going to pay your bills. So if you downgrade from a BMW to a Toyota Corolla, you bet everybody's going to be talking about you. Let them. It's not going to do any different for you. It's not they, Them talking is not going to pay your bills. Them talking is not going to send your kids to college. Them talking is not going to pay for your wife's vacations or whatever she or he wants. You got to stop worrying about what other people think if you want to become successful or happy or really anything in life. Because when you're so worried about what other people think, you become a slave to other people's opinions. 
And you got to be able to break out of that. Financially, that means when people see you downsize, they're going to make fun of you. But that also might require you to do some things that, you know, do, people might think you're weird. When I was in high school, I started playing this Indian drum called the tol. And being an entertainer or working in the entertainment business in the traditional Indian culture is like something that low class people generally have done. And so when I would go and work at these weddings, playing tol, you would run across traditional minded people like that that wouldn't even want to make eye contact with you because they would consider you such a low class person, almost like a uh, not even a human because you're just working in the entertainment business. Now, we were having fun. Like, we were high school kids, college kids, working at weddings, having a good time. You were making decent money. But you would find people that were just so stuck on this idea of status and pride that they wouldn't even want to talk to you. There was one event that me and my friends were working at. We were waiting to play the drum. And there was this uh, elder gentleman there who didn't want to come up to us and tell us to start playing. Instead, because we were so low class uh, as the entertainers, that you know, the drum players, he had a bag of pennies and nickels. He stuck his hand in the bag and would just start throwing pennies and nickels at your face, at our faces, saying, uh, essentially, get started. That way he wouldn't have to speak to us. And so this is where, if you're so focused, if I was so focused that, oh my God, what are people going to think of me if I do this? I would have never done that. If I never played that drum, I would have never gotten to know the DJs. If I never got to know the DJs, I would have never entered the event planning business. If I never ever entered the event planning business, I wouldn't have money to start investing in real estate when I did. If I didn't start investing in real estate, I wouldn't have become a realtor. If I didn't become a realtor, I would have never gotten involved with wholesaling real estate. If I didn't start wholesaling real estate, I would have never gotten involved with the internet and e-commerce because that wanted me to go into that industry. If I never got involved with the internet e-commerce, e I would have never ended up here on YouTube. So you got to be willing to just do what's right for you. The world loves talking. Go look at any Facebook ad or Instagram ad. What do you see? People hating. Because people hate when other people are trying to do something, trying to succeed, trying to achieve their dreams. Why are people running ads? Because they want to grow their business. People hate it. And it's just the way the world is. So let people talk. They're going to talk. That is what people are professionals at. But the haters are not going to be the ones that are paying your bills. So let, at least give them a good reason to hate. Number seven, make yourself replaceable. And this is, again, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you work for a company. If you work for a company, guess what? You are replaceable, no matter how good you are. You could be the most valuable employee at the company. And that's a very good thing. I'm not saying don't make yourself valuable. But what I'm saying is also have that value of replaceability for yourself because if you were to die or if you couldn't go into work tomorrow, and I know this is very dramatic, but if, if something happened and you couldn't get into work tomorrow, your company would have an ad out to find a replacement tomorrow, the same day, especially if you're very valuable. Now, again, I'm not saying don't make yourself valuable. You need to work to make yourself valuable. That way you can make the most money, provide the most value, learn the most things, and have the most ability to scale and grow within the company. But everybody's valuable. Even the CEO is replaceable at a company. But when I say make yourself replaceable, what I say, what I mean is you got to do something to make sure your family is still taken care of if you can't go into work tomorrow. Because if you don't work, you're not going to keep getting paid. And this is where now owning the assets is so important owning the rental properties, owning the stocks, owning the, whatever it is, your investments, having that wealth cushion. And it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it might happen over the next decade where now you're working to make money. That way you can own these assets. That way, if, hopefully doesn't nothing happens, but if something were to happen to you, your family is still okay. That's what I mean by making yourself replaceable. Same with your own business. If you are an entrepreneur, you have to make yourself replaceable in a company. If you are not the best CEO for your company, you want to fire yourself and bring on a new CEO. Yeah, you still own the company. And that's the point is you want to grow the profits. But if you're not cut out for it, bring somebody else on. And if you want to really be able to build a real business that you can sell, you have to make yourself replaceable. That was one of the big mistakes that I made in my early businesses because I had no idea what a business was. I just created a job for myself. And it was cool. I was making money. But if I wasn't working, I wasn't getting paid. 
And so if you want to make yourself replaceable in a business, that means you have to be able to pluck yourself out at some point. That's how you build a real business. It's the same thing whether you're working a job, whether you're working a business. You have to make yourself replaceable financially. That way, if something were to happen, the finances of your family can continue to survive. Number eight, plan for the worst, prepare for the best. And this is a mindset shift because, well, things will go wrong. It's life. And you want to make sure you can understand that, but also be able to capitalize on that. So what does that mean? Let me give you some real life examples. Recessions happen. They're a part of our economic system. We've seen recessions happen pretty much every decade for the last century. In fact, the longest period in our modern economic history without a recession was between the 2008 crash and the 2020 pandemic. That was the longest period in, the, in our modern U.S. history without a recession. So what does that mean? If you plan for the worst, prepare for the best, well, if you prepare, you can capitalize on recessions because... Recessions create more millionaires than any other time. Market crashes create the opportunities to build huge amounts of wealth in a short period of time. Because when you have these economic slowdowns, investments, assets go on sale because people are panicking. They never saw it coming. They are blindsided by this recession that nobody knew was going to happen ever. And people start panic selling. And you see good investments drop down. And sometimes you can buy these investments for pennies on the dollar. And if you're prepared... Well, now you can be the one that comes in and buy these investments for a huge discount. But that requires you to be prepared when times are okay. So prepare for the worst, plan for the best, be ready for good times, but also be ready for bad times as well. Now, one thing is that financial side, but that also means the practical side of preparing for the worst. Have insurance. Business insurance if you own a business. Landlord's insurance if you're investing in rental properties. There's a lot of different types of business insurances. Protect yourself. Get health insurance. Get life insurance. Uh, not all life insurance is good. Some, I, I prefer term life insurance, not whole life insurance. Term life insurance, I look at it like a bridge insurance where I don't have the assets to support my family if I were to die tomorrow. And so I want insurance, life insurance for 10 years until I can build my wealth or 20 years, whatever it might be. I prefer that type of term insurance. If nothing happens to you, you don't get anything, but you also save a whole bunch of money on the insurance payments because I'd rather you invest your money, build your assets, and not have to rely on an insurance company to build your wealth. But that's just me. People have different opinions. Make whatever op other opinions you want. Um, so yeah, just protect yourself and prepare for the worst. Number nine, find the opportunity in the bad. And there are so many different ways to do this. Like the most obvious are when you see a stock market crash, some people lose a lot of their wealth. You see, some people lose their retirement funds, people lose their life savings, but that also creates opportunity for you to come in, buy good investments for half off. That's the opportunity in the bad. When the 2020 pandemic hit, people were losing everything when the stock market was crashing. And some people were coming in and buying for pennies on the dollar. When the 2008 crash happened, people lost everything. People lost their homes. But real estate prices were then also selling for huge discounts. When I started investing in real estate, it was after the 2008 crash. It was around 2011 when I started investing in real estate. I'm in Michigan, not currently, but I was in Michigan then. And I was buying real estate for literally 90 to sometimes 92, 93% off. And it was because, well, there was bad things going on, but I also created opportunities. It's the same thing in business be able to find the opportunities in the bad. I had, uh, when I was starting Minority Mindset, I'll give you that example. I started off Minority Mindset just with an Instagram page. And uh, the Instagram page grew to around, uh, I think it was about 17,000 followers. I think it was actually 17,400 followers. And we didn't really have any other presence. I was thinking about starting a YouTube channel. I had like a couple videos here and there, but it wasn't anything significant. Uh, some YouTube videos and my Instagram page got hacked into and essentially deleted. I lost access to my Instagram account. Now I had spent a lot of time building this Instagram and just talking about the stuff that I talk about, financial education and entrepreneurship and all the things that I wish I would have learned when I was getting started. And when that got hacked and deleted, I realized I needed to have more of my own personal brand 
because you could delete my followers because back then, you know, Instagram, this is like, what, 2015, 2016, like that time, where Instagram was a very different place and you would just post other things. Like I was posting images of other things and writing about it. So people didn't really know who I was. And that's when I was like, you know what? I need people to know who I am. That way I can protect my brand even better from things like hackers. So that was a big motivation for then for me to start making YouTube videos and start talking, right? It was an opportunity which was then created out of that hacking. So it's it's all about now how do you find the opportunity in the bad? In fact, the reason why I started Minority Mindset at all was because I got scammed in a previous company. I was running an e-commerce company. I got scammed when I was running that company and I was so fed up from dealing with scams and just crap because I didn't have, again, I didn't have guidance as an entrepreneur. So when I got scammed for that time, which was, now I've been scammed many times after that, or since before that, after I got scammed running my e-commerce company, I was so fed up that I started this thing called Minority Mindset to help other people not get screwed over the way that I was. And that then grew to what it is today, finding the opportunities. Bad things happen. It's life. But how do you find the opportunity? Even in manure, right? What? You can grow some of the best fruits with the nastiest manure. So it's finding the right opportunities in the manure. And I don't know why I gave that example, but you get the point. And finally, mindset shift number 10. I don't even know if this is a mindset shift, but more of just a mindset is grit. Grit is the ability to get punched in the face, to get knocked down, to get screwed over, and continue to get back up and keep going. This is one of those traits that you see every successful person have. And this is going to be whether, again, you're an entrepreneur or not an entrepreneur. You have to have grit. If you're working a job, you need to have grit because guess what? Even working a job, you got to deal with a whole bunch of crap. You got to deal with the company politics. You got to deal with everybody else's crap. And then when you're working to build your wealth, you got to take the money and you got to invest it. And that means you got to deal with the crap of investing. That means you're going to have to deal with the down market cycles. You got to deal with the bad investments that you got to make. That means you might have to deal with bad tenants. You have to deal with all the crap that comes with putting your money to work. Losing money is a part of the process. The goal is to make way more than you lose, but every investor loses at some point. But you have to have the grit to not start crying and complaining and just give up when that happens. It's getting back up, doing it again, learning, doing it again, learning, doing it again, learning. When it comes to building a business, it's the same thing. Building a business is hard. And every challenge, I mean, every step of the way, you got different challenges. You know, making your first $10,000, that's hard. And that's a completely different challenge and skill set from going from $10,000 to 100000 And you might think, oh, man, when you make six figures a year, it all gets better. No, go from a million or 100000 to a million. Now you got a whole new set of problems and challenges. Go from a million to two million to five million and a whole new set of challenges. But you got to have the grit to keep getting up even when things suck, even when it feels like the whole world is against you, even when it feels like everybody hates you, even when it feels like everybody's talking crap about you, even when it feels like nothing is going right, to keep getting back up, putting in the reps, putting in the work, doing what it takes because that's what you want to do to get to your goals. That's what grit is. And that's, unfortunately, I don't think it's a mindset. This is really a lifestyle. But if you want to build that level of wealth, you got to be willing to put in that level of grit. This account is $2,000 and the max you want to have in your savings account is something like 12 months worth of expenses in your savings account in cash, liquid that you can access whenever you want. That way, in case something goes wrong, in case your kid's arm breaks, in case your AC goes out, you have cash that you can dip into that way you don't got to go into debt to fund these costs.